Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Um, I wanted to discuss something that uh, has uh, been an issue with humanity since the very beginning. And as human beings, we have a responsibility to uh, make a decision to side with God or not. And this is all of our responsibilities since the time of Adam. And God designed the system in such a way where in order to show our allegiance to God, we have to fulfill certain criteria. And the way that this is shown is that when God tells us to do something, we do it. And this is how we prove our allegiance. So believing in God is manifested through this, to this mechanism. That we do exactly what God says. It's obedience. And anything additional to this, any kind of uh, obedience to anything else is, con is constitutes another God besides God. And this sprouts, the, I, sprouts something called innovation. Innovative thinking, innovation of practice, and it shows when you no longer uphold only what God says, when you uphold innovation, it shows allegiance to other than God. So in the introduction of the Quran, it says that proclaiming one unified religion for all people. I just want to read a small uh, portion of it. It says, all religions of the world, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, and others have been severely corrupted through innovations, traditions, and idolization of humans, such as the prophets and saints. So we see that innovations and traditions have corrupted the one religion that God has established for humanity. And these are, all, these are all symptoms of people following idols. Now, this is one of the main reasons that God sent, sends his messengers, and specifically the messenger of the covenant, that when innovations have corrupted, the religion, corrupted God's religion into these multiple religions that we have, and these main ones that, have been, that I've mentioned, God sent his messenger to clarify things for us. Now, is believing in God enough? Believing in God is only enough when it's proven and we have no longer a claim against us. We also know the system is that the devil puts a claim on us and we have to prove that we are only, we are only uh, subservient to God. We only follow God. And God says, you fulfill your part of the covenant. And the covenant is what God says we do. And God says, you do your part, I will do my part. And God, you know, God's promise is the truth. When you do what you're, we're supposed to do, when we obey, God will do his part and give us happiness like what Nusha was talking about. And this is in 240, and 240 says that we do our part, God will do his part. So it's in our extreme, uh, in, in, it's in our interest in every way that we fulfill this obligation of upholding our part of the bargain or the covenant. Now, what is an innovation? It's anything uh, beyond this covenant. And it's so crucial that we follow what God has given us because, as I said, if you do anything else other than what God says, some other God, some other entity, you know, told you to do this and you're obeying it, whatever it is. It could be your ego. It could be the uh, idols of the saints that is mentioned. But we have to be very conscious of this because this is... This is so serious because it deals with us going back to God or not. So this concept of innovation, we need to know what it is so we can avoid it. We've all decided here to worship God alone. We've come, come to congregate together. We've come to a conference to you know, you know, hone our understandings and our beliefs so we maintain this. And we have to be very conscious of innovation. Now, innovation is talked, to, talked about in many different ways in the Quran. It's called uh, inventing things, and this is the context, of course, in religion. I'm not talking about, you know, uh, computer technology. Like, as, as far as innovation in the Quran, it's, talk, it's talked about as uh, inventing something, fabrications, lies attributed to God. What God tells us is the truth, and we must uphold that truth. Anything else that we don't have from God, that we don't know and we don't have confidence is from God, it constitutes innovation. So, you, I, I, so basically, I think it would be appropriate to classify uh, innovation as lies. These are lies. This is not truth. And it's very clear to see innovation's connection to idol worship. Idol worship 
Usually, this, and if not always, the symptom becomes innovations, however small or however big. And we know from 3965 that idol worship nullifies all works. I was in Russian this morning. It has been revealed to you and those before you that if you ever commit idol worship, all your works will be nullified and you will be with the losers. So f following anything that is innovative in religion can lead to nullifying all of our works. Everything you do, all your salats, all your righteous works, it'll be zero. Every and you and, and all your works will be in vain. So it's extremely crucial that we avoid any kind of innovative practices or innovations. Anything different than what God tells us. Now, as I said, this is one of the main reasons that God sends the messenger covenant. And unfortunately, in submission, a lot of times, people who choose to follow the path of God, they forget this. They forget this is one of the main reasons. They forget that the clarifications returns it back, you know, God sent the messenger to clarify the things that were polluted by innovations and return it back to the pristine purity. So we know the danger of innovations and like one can sprout into to thousands. We have the example, God gives us all these examples in, the, in today's world. We have the example of today's Islam. Thousands upon thousands of innovations with Hadith and Sunnah. And it's degenerated to, it's no longer a religion of God now. It's, it's become a satanic cult where they, where they kill people unjustly and they uh, worship human beings. It's gone to that extreme where they have all these innovative laws that they have no verification, there's no way to verify these things. And we have the other extreme with what happened to Christianity. They, they invented a concept where now it's just become a social function where you, everyone's motivated by wishful thinking. Now, I think it's very crucial that we understand that when God sends his messenger to clarify things for us, this information that we've been given is a gift from God in order for us to see the innovations that have been, that has been infected in the religion. And unfortunately, uh, we have, just because we have recognized the innovations of the past doesn't mean that there will no longer be innovations of the future. Now, we have many examples of this already happening. And as submitters, we have to be really wary of such things. We have people that under the guise of Quran alone and Quran alone, they now pray three times a day. Why is this? They say they believe in God alone, they say they worship, uh, they, uh, they say they follow the Quran alone, but they reject the messenger. They reject the clarifications. As I said, God sent his messenger to remove all these innovations, traditions, and corruption. This is, this is, the, this is one of the main reasons. We think about it, like why did God send a messenger? Now we have people that do this, and yet they claim to follow God alone and Quran alone. We have uh, people in submission now that they advocate women to lead the prayer in a mixed congregation. So we have to, uh, you know, and as crazy as it may seem now, the very reason that we recognize God sending the messenger of the covenant, people are now saying that this information is hadith. So what this does essentially is when you claim that the information from the messenger is now hadith, you discard all these clarifications, all the things that were told to us that identify innovations from, you know, these, you know, that people have interjected into the religion. How do we identify these things? Because God sent us a messenger to clarify and explain things to us. Now you call that hadith, what happens is you open the door for everyone else to interpret everything. And we start to come up with our no, new what? Innovations. Mr. X gets to say what they believe, Mrs. Y, everybody gets to say what they think, and we, don't, we have no longer any authorized true clarification to remove innovation. When you don't have authority from God to remove innovation, you create innovations. So we know how innovations begin through personal opinions. Quran tells us selective emphasis, taking things out of context, and these come all from the human being. Their conjecture. We don't have any authority from God. God gives his authority to whom he wills, and God, we know how God communicates through us. God gives the authority to people who God has chosen and that have authority, and these people are his messengers and prophets, and we have to obey them because we're, we have to obey God. Now, there's a concept in the Quran about uh, you know, things that 
can be, you know, how innovations can come out. I mentioned that through our understandings as a community, when we talk about our understandings with each other, we do Quran study groups. Sometimes we may have some understandings that are very radical, and we have to deal with these things, as God says, as submitters. We talk to each other, and we, we study the Quran carefully, and we try to come to uh, an agreement about what something is, uh, how, however long it may take, but we keep communication open. As submitters, communication is extremely important in order to avoid innovating anything. So whenever we understand something, we have to be, think about, am I potentially going down the path of innovation? Am I going down the path where God did not authorize this way of thinking? So this is one way. Another way we know is that we start doing something through practice. The Messenger Covenant gave an example of if we pray in, in, in a congregation and every time uh, we do something as a, as a group where we prostrate after the Salat, for example. We keep doing this over the years and years and no one ever talks about uh, you know, what, what we have inherited and what we need to pass down. Then eventually we'll start adding a prostration to the prayer. And we know that the prayer is mathematically uh, calculated and it's something where we, uh, it's like dialing a phone number where we connect to God. And we don't want to add any more prostrations or anything else additional because it will nullify it. So we know these are the ways that innovations can creep into our religion. And we know that when we have understandings, we have to be very careful not to advocate it unless we know for sure that this is what, this is what God says. So we have to be really we have to be very careful when we make a stand about a certain kind of understanding that we have. And among us as a community, as believers, we have to talk about these things very uh, intensely and carefully. And we have to look at everything in every way and don't uh, give in to our egos. Now, as I said, this is how the deterioration of religion happens. People, they stop upholding the commandments and they start giving validation to each other's opinions. We have to uphold what God has given us. Otherwise, 57.27, when it talks about the deterioration of religion, this will take place. Where it talks about all we ask for them to do is uphold the commandments approved by God. But they did not uphold the message they, sh they should have. They started wavering for the sake of the people. And we have, like I mentioned, today's Islam and today's Christianity and Judaism, they've deteriorated because of this. They've started giving validation to things that you know, God did not authorize. So God, is so, with all of his grace and mercy, has given us methods to prevent innovations. God gave us so many past precedences, the old era. We have all these examples about what we need to do. In uh, 634, it says, the histories of my messengers, thus sets the precedence for you. So if, for example, with the case of the women leading the prayer, this has never happened in history. We can identify this as an innovation. We have never had women leading the prayer in a mixed congregation. Bad. Traditions. We have traditions inherited from our parents. We have to be very open-minded. We love our parents. You know, uh, we, we, we love our, uh, most of us love our culture. I, can't, I don't know about me, but I, lo I love it. Yeah, sure. <laughs> but we have, to, uh, we have to be very crucial about the things we inherited. Like, why, are we, why do Americans celebrate Christmas? Why do we do these traditions? These traditions that came from somewhere, what are they advocating? What are they commemorating? We have to ask these kind of questions. We have to be thinkers, critical thinkers about what we do, or we will give into this innovative way of, we will we'll inherit the innovations of the past. This is what a tradition is. The difference between tradition and innovation is innovations become traditions and we inherit them. We, 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 don't have, we are responsible not to pass these, down to pass these down to later generations. So this is the way it works. Now that being said, I, I, I have to mention because I forgot, doing something ritualistically, I don't want to give the impression that that's an innovation. Like for example, if we want to uh, commemorate God in a way that is good for our souls, like we want to do that al fatah every morning, for example. This is something that God advocates in the Quran. God says, commemorate my name frequently. So not every you know, habitual practice that is not specifically said is innovation. Some things that God gave us you know, uh, approval to do. We should do, commemorate God a lot, do zek a lot. These things are good for us. But we have to be, so we have to understand that innovation is attributing something and saying God said so. God said do this. God, if you tell somebody God said that you have to do al-fatah like before you start your car, the whole thing, you have to do it. This is, becomes a claim that you're saying this is a law from God. So we have to be careful how we state things and how we advocate them too. So as I said, we have past precedences. We have, we have to examine the inherited information that we've had, been given. Uh, that's in 7, uh, 728. 
Everything that we receive has to be verifiable. Hadith and Sunnah are unverifiable information. And we know from the Quran confirmed that Muhammad never even said these things. They're lies. But, and for some reason, in submission today, they compare the information left to Hadith. This information is verifiable from the Messenger. We can see him, we can hear him. But Hadith is not verifiable. Verification is our responsibility. So if it's not verifiable, then we don't follow it. And the most crucial thing is obedience. We, in one of the speeches yesterday, it was mentioned in 6, uh, 267 uh, that when God said sacrifice a heifer, we say, yes, sir, we do it. We stop trying to uh, figure out the details when we don't need to. God says, dress nicely to the masjid. And then uh, people want to add more to it. So as a community, we have to be anti-innovation, and we have to keep this in the back of our minds, because the devil wants every excuse to, to get us to slip in any way. And I want to end with this verse uh, from 9.112 as a quality of the believers, because this is our responsibility. Our responsibility is to uh, make sure that the religion stays the way it is for the later generations. We have to worry about ourselves, but we also have to uh, pass on what was passed on to us without any changes. In 112 it says, they are the repenters, the worshipers, the praisers, the meditators, the bowing and the prostrating, the advocators of righteousness and forbidders of evil, and the keepers of God's laws. Give good news to such believers. Thank you. All right, questions. Let's start with, oh, wow. Okay, I'm going to have to prioritize here. Let's start with Shabnam. I saw her hand first, and then we'll go around. Mashallah, thank you, Rod, for that speech. Um, I have two questions. I'm from the school of thought that not, we don't necessarily have to say God said so in order to um, start an innovation. Um, I believe, for instance, like if we start doing something in front of others and we habitually do it, uh, even if we tell them it's not, God doesn't say so to do this, but we still habitually do it, eventually it can lead to someone, you know, I mean, other people doing the same thing because they think it's a righteous thing to do. Like, for instance, the prostration after Salat. Okay, so we know like it's very common among Iranians um, or maybe even other cultures, but after Salat, they would prostrate. And I don't believe that necessarily they would say, oh yeah, God said so, we should prostrate after Salat. I just think that somebody just felt like doing it, they did it in public and, or maybe you know, in private, but in front of someone at home, and it just picked up. So I, I think that um, in, we have to watch what we are doing or saying in front of others if it's something that's not specifically um, uh, expected of us to do. Um, I want to know what your thoughts are on that, one. And the other thing is that, you know, among, uh, we're family, so God tells us to behave in a certain way with our family. What do you think, um, how should we behave if a family member starts doing things that can lead to an innovation, but they don't see it like that. No matter how much you tell them, they are very stubborn about their uh, belief, and they don't see it like that. But how should our behavior be towards that person? Okay. Uh, so the first question, I, the way I understand it is that um, not every uh, habitual practice that a person may uh, undergo every day can be harmful to us. And what I mean by that is, is uh, when we you know, decide, for example, we have this uh, routine where we, when we drive on the highway and commuting to work for an hour, for example, uh, we like to do commemoration. So this is something that I do every time I go to, uh, and my children see it and everyone sees me do it and they start doing it themselves. I don't see any way that that would, according to the Quran, uh, nullify like any kind of uh, works that I do through idol worship because I'm commemorating God. So I think the way it would be is that when I, when I would say that you have to attribute it to God is because you're saying that this is a law where it was never said to be. 
So with the example you gave with the prayer, the, the, the distinction I make between any kind of habitual practice and that is that the potential danger there, as I mentioned, is that when you start doing things that will corrupt our practices, like the ones we inherited from the time of Abraham, because they're not mentioned in the Quran. We have received them through practice. Like you would say, people see each other doing it. When you do a prostration in the Salat, you have potentially would corrupt that. You would corrupt the practice by adding to it. And we know these things are specific. We know when God says do something specifically, you pray five times a day, you do this many prostrations, we do it. When we start praying like three times a day or with less prostrations or with more prostrations, we've, uh, we've corrupted it. And these happen through like little subtleties. So I think uh, we, if we use the Quran as a criteria to see it, the things that we do habitually are damaging or not, I think that's the best indicator. And for your other question about the family member, I would, um, it, it's really hard to answer that because there's a lot of things that we may interpret may lead to innovation. Leading to innovation, like having a wrong understanding about something, is not an innovation in my, to, to my understanding. Some, a lot of things can lead to, in, to innovation. Bad understandings, of course, but we have to be uh, you know, tolerant with each other and talk to, about these things. So I would try to talk about them, but if they're stubborn in the sense where they've decided to make an innovation, that's different. So like, as I said, you know, we have to obviously work with each other as a community to enlighten each other to see what is the correct way to do things according to the Quran. Inshallah, let's limit the questions to one per person because we have many people who want to ask questions. Yeah. Um, go ahead. So um, can uh, recommendations ever uh, become an innovation? That, that's just a question I'll throw. I think that uh, if people recommend something to you based on, and they make it clear that it's not something that was established by God, then I don't see any harm with re recommending things. I know that uh, many submitters, they may give advice to their fellow submitter by saying that I wouldn't do this, for example. And uh, as a personal choice in their life, as a way to be safe than sorry. A lot of times as submitters, we have these situations where we, have to, we would rather take the safe approach than you know, potentially sin. Uh, you know, and we always repent, like we have the example of David's exemplary piety. So uh, as long as we're saying it in a way to avoid sin, I don't see any problem. As, as I said, we have to uh, word things very, uh, in a very uh, clear way. You know, God tells us to utter the correct utterances in order not to mislead others. So collectively, we may say, all recommend something over and over and over and, and eventually may establish to God, but that doesn't mean that recommending things is wrong. Testing? Cool. Salam alaikum, Rad. Uh, good speech. Um, I just want to hear kind of your point of view and because with upholding the truth, we know that God tells us that we uphold the truth. Um, we have to advocate, we have to actually exhort each other to uphold the truth and that we're keepers of his laws, right? Now, however, some people, the reverse of this saying that um, this causes groupthink and everybody becomes like-minded and there's no free thinking, you know, and it becomes kind of like a cult. What do you have to say about that? Yeah, I've heard this concept of groupthink uh, quite often in reference to you know, people who wish to think like-mindedly. But uh, concepts like groupthink, I don't see any chronic basis for it because God tells us that the believers are unified and the believers follow the straight path, which is you know, strict obedience and things that show the similarities rather than the differences. So I would say that, um, you know, Striving to think the same about our Creator and think the same about how to show our allegiance to God through you know, the laws that was established, there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's, uh, it's actually something that should be strived for. Now, the differences of the school of thought, what you're referring to is that one thinks that this is, impo is a possibility to have a community of people that uh, have no differences in the sense of knowing who God is and what we have to do as far as you know, following the Quran. But what I say to that person is, God is the one who guides. Are you saying God can't guide a community to do the things the same and worship God alone the same? It's, uh, it's just contrary to what the Quran tells us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Great speech, brother. Um, I think uh, he wants us to just go by this subject, but I think this is one of the most important subjects uh, that we can ever discuss. 
Innovation, I can see it. I mean, I'll be kind of giving a contribution. I can see it as a, as a denial of God or let's say you might be doing something. God might ask you to do it this way and you're doing it a different way. That's innovation, right? Or God is telling you this is because of this and you say, no, 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 it's because of that. Let's say um, if, if your dad is Bill Gates, Everybody is expecting you to be rich, right? He's rich because his dad is rich, right? But Allah said in the Quran, I choose, I make whoever I want rich, I choose to, to make him rich and to make him poor. For what? To test him. He's not rich because his dad is rich. He's rich because Allah had decided that he's going to be rich. I mean, you're right there denying Allah, just saying, um, we got... Uh, we all probably got those kind of uh, uh, customs. Uh, in Africa, we say uh, if, uh, if somebody got rich, let's say you got uh, a family of four, one of them just came out of nowhere and become a, a, a millionaire. What they're saying is he was, they're going to give him some kind of qualities like uh, he was good to his mom or he was uh, some kind of stuff to justify why he's rich over the others. The only justification should be because Allah, because God have decided that he's going to be rich. You're there taking something from God and giving it to the mama. You're there taking something from God and giving it to Bill Gates. You're there taking something from God and giving it to whoever else. And that's dangerous. That's an uh, uh, innovation we know. We, uh, we see all over the world, everybody innovating, the way of praying, the way of fasting. One, just one question. We are our fifth. We all want to go one day to Mecca, you know, to perform our fifth, uh, uh, going for Hajj. We, we see that in this world right now, we are not all fasting the same day. Some fasting, we should, I believe we all, it is one moon, we all should be fasting the same day, right? We might be seeing it over here, and Saudi them saying that we didn't say. So we we started fasting this July 28th, and they be fasting on July 29th. By now, when it's time to go to Mecca, we go in with them. What's the problem? Don't you see any problem here? Don't you see that we are following people? We should be going on the on on August 20th, but we going on August 21st because we are following them because they are conditioning us. They're telling us you cannot go to Mecca till we decide it's time to go to Mecca. I see that as a problem. Was it time for this time to say, no, I am going this time because if I go, I'll be following those you know, that are innovating. I'm not, I'm not going there at the right time. Why should I be following those who do not want to follow? The moon was here. They decide not to go with it. I mean, I... I, I I see a lot of problems. I mean, it's a, it's a very, 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 very sensitive subject and very dangerous because it, it can deviate you right away. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, something that we can go and talk about in the study, but uh, just to say something quick about it is that, yeah, is the, the, the Saudi government has gone out of the way to make it extremely difficult for people to do Hajj, uh, you know, according to what God has said. But um, I leave it up to the individual to see what they, you know, what they can do to do the practice according to what God said. You know, it's like, they, like you said, they give us a small allotted week of time to do it. But uh, we can talk about it, God willing, in this study tonight. So. Rod, uh, you explained it very well. But my question is, what is the root cause of innovation? Looks like any time there was a religion, there was innovation. Is it uh, the human ego that caused it? People want to say, uh, see what God says, but add to it what I think needs to be, you know, in, in your scope. You filter it, add something to it, or just look at it from a very specific point of view, as, as I said, or is it the root cause of uh, innovation, the, the human ego? The simple answer is yes, it's, it is the ego that, that you know, people follow their personal opinions. But just to give a, a, a practical example from my experience, what I've seen, in modern day, 
people, uh, the, mo you know, the modern day people, uh, when they pr push the idea of innovation, I see that they look at the Quran in a way where it's not something to be obeyed strictly. They look at it as a way of thinking of something, thinking of certain verses and certain concepts in a new light, innovative thinking. Like a, a genius would see something and look at it in a new way, to be praised, to be like, oh wow, this person saw something that we've never seen before, and they expand on this idea. And then they start a whole new movement based on this conjecture. And it, it causes a rift. So if we look at the Quran as somebody as, who wants to strictly obey what God says, then I believe God will give us access to that. So it depends on our intentions when we read this scripture.